Come on in. So, how's everybody doing? Y'all all right? You know, I, I have this thing that I believe that I say. I'm, ma I'm making shirts very soon. Um, you should, when they come out, hot off the press, they're going to fly. So God made us, right? And we suck. <laughs> we made technology, and what the hell did you expect? <laughs> That's just how it is. <laughs> so, so welcome to our final, final word crawl of the day. At Cite the Arts, we appreciate you, Cite, for allowing us to be here. Y'all give Cite a round of applause. <laughs> and raise your hand if you've been with us since 12 noon. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Even I took a break. <laughs> Raise your hand if this is your first word crawl event. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It's great to have you here. And word crawl, so you all know, is a fundraiser. It's a 12 hour fundraiser for the Festival of Words annual festival in Grand Coteau, Louisiana. We host the, the annual Festival of Words event every first November of the year, it's a two-day festival, and this is a creative way we thought to raise money. Awesome, and our, and our wordsmiths, our readers, have gained sponsorship from loved ones and people throughout the community to gain a 10-minute spot to read here at Word Crawl tonight. So poets, please give yourselves a round of applause. Are you guys ready to get started? Total? Yeah, what's our total? We, each person had to raise a, a hundred, but it's over five thousand. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure of the exact number. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for, for supporting us. It's truly a, a phenomenal event. Um, this is our first, first fourth, no, I'm sorry, fifth word crawl. Um, it's, I'm so excited. Y'all, I'm tired. It's been a long day. Huh? Because I didn't sleep last night. <laughs> So y'all ready to get started? Where's our timer? Marie, are you on right timer? Here. Hello. Awesome, awesome. So poets, our timer, you have 10 minutes on stage. Our timer will hold up two to let you know. Three. You guys three. are doing three? Yeah. Okay, so, okay. So you guys are doing three, two, one. Okay. Okay. So this one, we're going to do three minutes, two minutes, and then one minute, and then cut. Well, we're going to do this one now? Cause that was my favorite. I was gonna, <laughs> when I, I was timer at Carpe earlier, and this was yeah. what I wanted. Get off. <laughs> so our first wordsmith to the mic is Sally O'Donnellan. Sally is a mother, sister, educator, and community rabble rouser with a checkered educational past. I like that. I like that. I like that. That means you're well rounded. In more ways than one. Right. As an entrepreneur at heart. She is found, fond of people, books, animals, children, and travel. She does not like mean people. Me either. Y'all give it up for Sally O'Donnelly. Blessings, you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings. And I'm also short, let's see. <laughs> my name is Sally, I'm a local girl, and this is part of my story. I grew up in a weather-beaten old wooden house, the kind you might drive by and say was probably really nice in its day. The paint had flaked off the clapboards and the pilings were grown up with weeds. We did have an uncommonly beautiful and gnarly old crepe myrtle out front. The few friends who'd agreed to come over at all said the house looked like it was haunted. All in all, it was a great house to grow up in. One of the greatest things about the house was the location. I know that's a bit of a cliche, but in this case, that old chestnut rings with the clarity of truth. The house I grew up in was right downtown, 
Back in the day when downtown was a very different place, a seedier and more raggedy place. Compared to downtown today, the neighborhood seemed a bit down in the mouth, but I didn't realize that then. That type of comparison never occurs to a girl growing up in a seedy southern downtown. Back then, that was all I knew. Up at one corner, there was Hyman's department store with its fabulous fabric department and the wonderful balustered mezzanine. That mezzanine featured a swell overlook perspective that came in handy when playing hide and seek. Opposite was Hyman's food store where all the black women would come on their weekly shopping trips, parking on the curb outside my house and leaving their little ones behind in the car. I'd sit on the curb and chat up the kids until their mamas came back, pushing carts, heavy laden with groceries. Rising from the curb, I'd introduce myself to the ladies and offer to return the carts, which offer they'd always take me up on. Down at the other corner was the local pub, a neighborhood dive run by a man named Mr. Frank. My folks always called the place Frank's, but the faded gilt label on the glass window in the door proclaimed it the Senator's Lounge. Dad said it was a joke that Mr. Frank played on unwitting first-timers. There was always a poker game going in the back room and a real root beer tap right up near the front door. We kids weren't allowed to go in, but we could stick our heads and our torsos around the front door, knock on the bar, and hand Mr. Frank our glass. He always sat on a stool behind the bar near the front. He'd fill our glasses. I've seldom had better root beer in my entire life. One block down from the Senator's Lounge and a block and a half from my house was the public library. Polk Street teed into East Main at that point and the library sat squarely in the middle. You could see the library coming as you walked toward it. It was always a reassuring sight. Inside was a large WPA mural covering the entire upper half of the wall in the large children's reading room. That mural fairly writhed with workers forging iron and hammering spikes and shoveling coal, all of them larger than life and looking down on you as you read. It was a thing of wonder. Having a library in the neighborhood was also a thing of wonder and we kids spent a whole lot of time there reading books and looking at pictures of the pyramids in the viewfinders. Through the parking lot directly across Polk Street, which ran in front of my house, was Jefferson Street, or Main Street as we called it, if you walked through the parking lot and turned right, you'd first come across City Barbershop where men lined up to hear Mr. Elmo tell his stories as much as to have their hair cut. Then next to that was Red Gardner's newsstand. My brother and I spent lots of time in there reading magazines and comics off the shelf and keeping out of the heat. If you had turned left coming out of the parking lot, you'd see Antler's Pool Hall. In those days, Antler's was a real pool hall the kind that kids and ladies did not enter. But they had the best chili and cheese dogs in town and we'd wait outside while my dad went in and ordered them for us sometimes. He'd carry them out and we'd sit on the curb and eat them right there. Years later, when I was at university, Antlers was retrofitted as a fern bar. It seemed a classy place, but I could see the vents above the stage where my dad had told me the bookies would keep watch out for the police raids that occasionally occurred. <laughs> Main Street between Vermilion and Congress was the official domain of my daddy's downtown cronies. They'd hang around smoking cigars, talking politics. I don't know how any work got done in those days because there they'd be almost any time you'd wander into that stretch of real estate. Occasionally, my dad or one of his buds would sidle up against a timber light pole to scratch their shoulder or their back, and they would say the craziest thing, God bless the Duke of Argyle. And they'd fit that right into whatever the rest of the conversation they'd been having was about. No one found it strange, and they all did it, but none of those men could tell me what it meant or why they said it. I puzzled over that for my entire childhood. All of these places and things were good things to grow up with, but the really, really, really best thing was right next door to my house. In the center of a large open lot was a black Baptist church. Off in the corner of the lot was a small house. The preacher was a farmer who lived out in the parish, and he'd come into town on Saturday afternoon bringing his wife and two kids with him. They'd all stay in the little house next door. 
The boy was my brother John's age, and the girl was about my age. So we had a little extra companionship every weekend. That big white church, though, was the most beautiful building I had ever seen. In those days, there wasn't a lot of air conditioning, and summers were darn near as hot as they are now. The church was raised up on piers off of the ground and had been constructed in such a way that whole panels along the sides could be thrown open like doors. This meant that the pews and the people in them were on full display. In front, facing Polk Street, was a largish vestibule-type outcropping that jutted out from the rectangularity of the main hall. Huge cypress French doors opened off the three sides of this vestibule, and steps led down to the street on all three sides as well. It was a marvel. Once, my brother Ben had been bathing in our clawfoot bathtub in our single bathroom that overlooked the side of the old church. The Baptists had opened up the baptismal pool and were busy dunking some newly saved congregationists. Ben stood up on the edge of the tub and looked out the bathroom window just in time to see the fellow go under, the preacher holding him fast by the collar. Mama! Mama, come quick! They're drowning him! Mama, they're murdering him! Call the police! Of course, those panels were thrown wide open, and Ben was screeching to beat the band, so all the Baptists heard the hoorah and looked up toward our house, where the little naked white boy was looking out the windows and yelling. My mom had to wrap Ben in a towel and cart him away from the window while my dad went out to apologize. Our neighbors were real neighborly about the whole episode and laughed with my dad on their steps. But the memory that comes back to me most strongly about that church and my Sundays growing up next to it is of a different sort. Those Christians were emotional and sincere and knew how to talk in tongues when the Spirit took a hold of them, which is a wondrous thing to experience. I highly recommend it. Now, whether it will have the same impact on you as it did on two small children, I cannot say, only that it was a wondrous thing. Most Sundays, my brother John and I would watch while the Baptists pulled up in their cars, parked along the street in front of our house, climbed out, mingled in all their finery. They'd arrive almost an hour before the service began and stand around talking and laughing. Finally, the bells would toll and the folks would climb those three-sided steps and take their places in the pews. The preacher would start to preach and the Christians would start responding. Pretty soon, they had a fairly good give and take going and things picked up dramatically. Before long, one pretty woman would stand and sway, overcome by the Holy Ghost. She'd start crying out in a language unlike anything this little Episcopal girl had ever heard. She was talking in tongues. After that, others would be inspired by the Spirit, and they'd start up too. As soon as the last folks had settled into their pews, John and I would have wandered over to the church and crept up the central steps, reclining in the sun, we'd rest our heads on the topmost step and peek over the threshold, right down the center aisle of the church. We'd watch the folks swaying and calling and talking to their savior, and we were mesmerized. Believe me when I tell you, to a six-year-old, it was pure magic. The service wore on, the sun beamed down, the gospel music swelled, and that strange language rose and fell in the warm air. At some point, John and I would both fall asleep right there, sprawled out on those broad white steps. We'd awaken when a couple of those good people, the first out of the church, found the little white kids sleeping on the steps and scooped us up in strong arms. Carrying us back to our house next door, the men would joke about picking up manna from heaven. They'd knock on our door, John and I still groggy from napping in the sun and him still ringing in our heads, and deliver us to our mama. Still filled with the spirit, they'd always thank her for letting them carry us home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. We appreciate appreciate you. That was wonderful, beautiful, and I love your glasses, by the way. Also, before we call up the next wordsmith, AOC. Thank you guys so, so much for being here with us. Since 12 noon, probably earlier than that, guys, thank you. Thank you so much for coming out and supporting us.
I promise not to drink all your coffee. Every I know where the French vanilla is. <laughs> okay, guys, so you ready for the next performer? Oh, yeah. The next person? Yeah. I don't know about that. Let's try it again. Are you ready for the next one? Yeah. Y'all did great. This side of the room. <laughs> Are you guys ready for the next performer? Yeah. <laughs> I, your, your, your smile is great. I appreciate it. Okay, I'm silly, guys. So, and the next wordsmith actually was our first out of town visitor to Gates Sponsorship and turned her application first. She's from New Orleans. And we'd like to thank you so much for coming out and supporting Festival of Words. She also uh, won a free weekend at Casita Azul. Whoa. I still have not spent the night at Casita Azul, but that's a petty conversation I'll have with Patrice and Olin later. So please give it up for Catherine Protzer Labor. Bless you. Working. Hello. All right. Hello. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, welcome to me. Hi. Um, you know, um, as I, t I, t I teach writing, in fact, I teach writing where Patrice used to teach. Uh, she was the creative nonfiction writer, and now I am the creative nonfiction writer. Yay. And when I'm teaching my students creative nonfiction writing or professional writing, I tell them, every time you write, you're writing. And they say, Every time you write, you're writing. What does that mean? And basically, it means that you're always working the muscle. That said, um, I'm going to read to y'all. I'm calling this the Facebook monologues. I'm reading Facebook posts from this year. Because every time you're writing, you're writing. Tomorrow, I'll be writing about you. All right. Sunday. I was dancing in my head as I examined frozen vegetables when I heard, excuse me, ma'am. I thought this guy simply wanted to get past me, and so I closed the freezer door to move aside. But he said again, excuse me, ma'am. And he looked me in the eye, and I felt something in my heart tumble out of place. There was something damaged about him. I took a breath and smiled and said yes. And he tried not to look, or rather I tried not to look, at the black back brace that wrapped around his round body and nodded and smiled as he asked me about putting turkey bacon in beans and rice and if he should fry it and what about the fat and the like. And I tried not to stare as he held up the package and pointed to the words turkey bacon quite deliberately with what was left of his rough hand. Facebook? Yeah. You can friend me. Okay. <laughs> These are not all my Facebook posts. Okay. August 26th. I find myself digging into some notes about something that took place once upon a relationship in order to work on a fictional piece due soon, a surprise deadline. The piece is fiction, but these notes feel like fiction too. That was me, that was us, and I know how that story ends. <laughs> August 18th. Goodbye, dear stretched out, worn out, now to be thrown out, soft and loose jammy bottoms. Farewell, dancing bulls, jumping cows. My son saw you often in the kitchen by the stove as I stirred that veggie stir fry. You knew the feel of my bed, my office chair, the kitchen chairs, one soft couch and another. A neighbor or two may have seen you as I dragged the can to the curb. A man or two must have admired you as I dragged my own can around. <laughs> For years, many years, you have covered my ass. But since you keep falling off, it's time to let you drop. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> Last night, well, very early this morning, and this is August 2nd, I realized a birthday, okay, his birthday, had come and gone without my realizing it. 
This morning, late in the morning, I found a note on the back of a recipe card, a directive from my mom that was waiting for me after school one day, taped to the door. Mm, time. Two years ago, I celebrated that birthday. Almost 50 years ago, I did as my mom said. <sighs> Life. The changes you bring over decades, over years, do not go unnoticed. <laughs> July 8th. I walked into a drugstore the other day and on the way to the garbage bag section found myself stopped at the site of a foundation system for faces that when applied seemed to make the model look like a mannequin. Why would someone want to do this to herself? Are we so swayed by airbrush beauty that we can't fathom any other look? H-A-S-H-T-A-G, hashtag, I'm aging, hashtag, so are you, hashtag, eventually someone will notice this, hashtag, yeah, it sucks, but this is why God made ice cream. <laughs> May 4th. So last night after a shower, I heard voices talking. 2.30 in the morning, talking. I peeped out the window and saw the voices were coming from the neighbor's backyard. My neighbor and his ex-girlfriend, the one who moved out a year or more ago. And I did so want to open the window and shout, no neighbor boy, she's crazy. And no neighbor boy, look at your foot, look at your foot. See how it's shaking, listen to your foot. But I was tired, and so I went to bed, first making note of the time, just in case. <laughs> April 23rd. Some days I feel like the chicken lady freak at the end of the movie, freaks. Squawk, 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 and all for naught. <laughs> April 30th. Last night, dinner with a friend I have not seen in 10 years, unless you count having run into her just the night before. Dinner outside, dinner out back, dinner nearly finished, and we notice the Formosan termites gathering. Turn the lights off, she tells her husband, and as he rises to do so, I marvel at those fluttering wisps of moonlight sweeping about the light globes. They are so terrible, those termites are, yet such a wonder, too. <laughs> April 17th, uh, I should mention here my mother lives in assisted living. Tired, hungry, and having popped in to deliver some things to my mom, I was on my way out when I heard the band in the lobby. I went toward the music rather than toward the exit, and when I recognized the beginnings of Moonglow, I weaved past the parked wheelchairs for a spot where I wouldn't block the view. Moon glow. And as I stood in a spot so near this 10 piece band, all but one of the musicians about the same age as the residents, the young trombonist, he was about my age, in scrubs invited me to sit in a nearby chair. I found myself instead leaning dreamily against the door frame. The music filled the space around and above me and filled the space in my head as it bobbed along with each luxurious solo. And by the time the pianist's lips found the mic, it must have been moon glow, way up in the blue. By that time, my eyes were filling with tears, the good kind, the kind that happen when you're having a moment, the kind of tears that happen because such a moment is a gift. April 6th. After a week of dealing with a student who is, well, a poor example of a human and will likely end up in prison one day, but meanwhile does not listen either to you, nor the universe, nor society, it's nice to sit in the breeze and think about the bright yellow daisies you are soon to plant in place in, pan in painted pots. April 1st. No context given. Some will assume we to be a noun. I see it as a verb. <laughs> March 27th, getting a massage, or rather having gotten a massage, and the massage is ending, and the therapist, a woman I assume to be a little older than I am, comments on the music, saying it reminds her of Seals and Croft. 
She likes seals and croft. She likes the sounds of electric guitar, of guitars, not ducks and waves like the other massage music. She laughs. No, not ducks, and she remembers how back in the 70s, her friend had a portable record player, and they would take this record player outside and listen to Carly Simon and James Taylor, and she would name one or two others, but by this point, I have broken away. I am drifting away to a shady wooden porch I've seen somewhere, waves of vibrant green grass before me. I only have one minute, I'm skipping. <laughs> February, when people from your past, this is Mardi Gras Day, when people from your past do something childish and mean-spirited, ponder that action all the rest of the day. Cry a little, cry, don't weep. Go to bed, eat a lot the next day. This is why God made chocolate, go to bed. Then wake up in the morning and write an essay. It's not revenge, it's just what you do. <laughs> Last one, January. Sometimes it takes a few weeks to determine a New Year's resolution, but last week this year's became clear to me. No more pasta sauce from a jar. It's so much better when you make the stuff yourself, or at least when I make it myself, and when I do, life and the sauce is so good. <laughs> Give it up for Miss Catherine again. And the Casita Azul thing, I'll get over it because I'm going to stay there. But you should, if Not you. <laughs> and yes, she is gloriously petty. You are, just like me, I'm gloriously petty. It is what it is. Um, but if you ever need a, a mini vacation, Patrice has a wonderful Airbnb. It's beautiful. And then she makes marmalade and stuff, right? You have, she has preserves and <laughs> Casita Azul is like, it's like heaven in Gran Cato. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have to clean it when I say, no. <laughs> Y'all ready for the next poet? Yes. This is uh, one of my favorite people and I love her hair today. Um, she, <laughs> what? <laughs> What about the other day? <laughs> <laughs> she, she normally doesn't have purple. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, she's a novice, a novice short story writer, former journalist, marketing director uh, of Nunu Arts and Cultural Collective. Give it up for the wonderful, beautiful Jackie Cochran and her wonderful hair. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Okay, so this is my story that I just wrote, first time. The story of a young woman's first camping trip. It's titled Camping 101. Pam knew the way and Arlette had the how, they assured her. Peggy had never been camping unless you count two hours at the age of nine in a backyard pitch tent as an initial introduction. So when her newly found friends came up with the idea to travel to Palomar Mountain for an overnight camping trip, she was all for it. The plan was to leave San Diego first thing Saturday morning and return Sunday afternoon. The trip was to take just under two hours. That Friday afternoon, they packed full the massive tr trunk of Pam's 1972 Chevy Caprice. Tent, lanterns, sleeping bags, a box containing various cooking pans, skillets and utensils, a flashlight, should the lanterns not work, a mallet for driving stakes, and a small ax, which Arlette said was very much needed for clearing the campsite and cutting firewood. A large ice box sat front and center in the trunk, 
for easy access during rest stops. The non-perishable grocery list included two gallons of water, a case of beer, two six-packs of canned tomato juice, a six-pack of soda, three cans of refried beans, and Jiffy Pop. Perishable items such as eggs, bacon, and boneless chicken breasts would be purchased in the morning along with the ice to frappe all that required frapping. Peggy was thrilled, a real camping trip up a real mountain, she thought. The morning of their departure, the three friends met at Pam's. They drove to the market where the ice box was layered with beer, juice, soda, ice, eggs, and meats. Now they were ready. The back seat of the four-door sedan was also filled with items deemed necessary for the trip. Two quilts, backpacks containing changes of clothes, and a portable radio com combination eight-track player. The three friends shared the roomy front seat with camping novice Peggy seated in the middle. You serve as navigator, Pam said, and handed Peggy the California state map. Here are the highways we need to take, and pointed to a north then east route. Easy drive, straight up and over. Peggy looked at the map carefully so as to fully understand the markings and highway designations. Looked simple enough, she thought. The friends left San Diego on State Highway 163, just as the morning fog was beginning to lift. There seemed to always be a morning fog this close to the Pacific, and Peggy often no mentioned that she could almost set her watch by its exit, about 10 a.m., she would estimate. Driving through Miramar, they reached the Interstate 15 entrance ramp and were now freeway bound. California freeways were massive, four and sometimes even six lanes of traffic entering and exiting. For Peggy, it was all a bit intimidating as until this time, she knew only the confines of a single urban setting. While the three were all of the same age, Pam and Arlette were both experienced drivers and travelers, having lived in several states. Peggy, on the other hand, was an experienced rider of public transportation, which neither of her friends were. Peggy rode trusting her safety to those in charge. About 20 minutes into the drive, Pam decided it was time to fully gas up the great beast and exited the freeway. At that first service station, at the first service station scene, she pulled up to a pump and parked. Pam directed the attendant to fill the tank and check the engine. Meanwhile, Arlette exited the car so as to stretch her legs and smoke a cigarette. Peggy, take the keys and open the trunk so we can all get a drink, Pam called out. Pam reached over and removed the keys from the ignition and then slid across the seat and out of the car. Peggy opened the trunk to the car and then reached into the ice chest and extracted a soda for herself and Arlette and a juice for Pam. The friends stood by the car, enjoying their drinks and speaking of what was ahead and how much longer it would take to reach the mountain park area. The bill now paid and all now refreshed, the three proceeded to return to the car, the trunk was closed, and back into the car they went, eager to continue the drive. Pam reached the ignition, asked, where are the keys? Silence followed. Peggy's mind went blank. Out of the car again, the three came, and gathered now facing the trunk. Calmly, Pam asked, do you remember what you did with the keys after opening the trunk? No, Peggy answered. Arlette then stated out what each thought. They're probably in the trunk. That was enough for Pam. Off she walked briskly to the station office, and within minutes returned with the station attendant. We'll have to remove the back seat to get through, he said. Pam and Arlette together emptied the back of, the, of our gears, emptied the back seat of our gear so the station attendant could remove the seat. He roughly pulled and then yanked at the seat, finally freeing it so it could be lifted and removed. Peggy sat off to the side on an empty five gallon can, watching. Arlette stood with Pam, ready to assist. 
But when the ten attendant pulled back the seat, when the attendant pulled the back of the seat away from the cab frame, all hope evaporated. The frame supporting the back of the seat was one solid sheet of metal containing only a one by two foot opening upon which the tent was visibly pressed against from inside the trunk. Now the work of replacing the seats began and repacking of the gear. Pam thanked the attendant and handed him some cash. He suggested that she call a locksmith. Pam said nothing concerning Peggy's loss of keys. Arlette, who had returned to her seat in the car, remained silent. Peggy remained seated on the empty can, likewise silent. A telephone booth stood off from the station close to the road. Pam walked to it and entered and began searching through the telephone book that was attached to a holder mounted within the booth. The morning sun was beginning to rise ne nearly overhead and warm the day. Arlette emerged from the car and walked back over to the trunk. Peggy watched Arlette as she bent slightly and began passing her hand between the car bumper and trunk closure. Out came the keys. Peggy ran over to the booth and knocked on the glass, exclaiming, Arlette's found the keys. Arlette has the keys. Pam, smiling now, informed the locksmith on the telephone that his services would not be necessary and thanked him. Following some exchanges of rejoicing and additional expressions of appreciation to the attendant, the three were back in the car and ready to continue on their trip. Peggy was a bit surprised when Pam handed her the map, and off they drove, northbound and recovered. The day had just started and they were anxious for adventure, or so Peggy thought. Jubilant and singing along with the country and western songs blaring out from the radio, the three discussed ongoing studies at the nursing school where they attended, and Arlette related the story of her first camping trip with her family in Pennsylvania. Peggy resumed studying the map and noticed that there, they were soon to reach an exit that connected to a state highway that passed in a winding di diagonal direction through a town called Valley Center and over to Highway 76 the main highway from which they will enter the state park. She thought, why go north and then over when a quicker way is a straight line between two points? She did not even consider the fact that it was not a straight line. There is an exit coming up called Bear Valley Parkway. Let's get off and follow that to the state park, Peggy said. It's a shorter route. I think it will be quicker to stay on the highway system, all that commented. You're the navigator, Pam said. If you think it will get us there in less time. I do. It's a parkway, so it's not some gravel road. Let's give it a try, and we can see more of the countryside than from the freeway, Peggy said, wide-eyed with anticipation. Pam turned off the freeway at the Bear Valley Parkway exit, and the car began traveling northeast along Highway 6, and unbeknownst to the three, into Hellhole Canyon Preserve. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jackie, thank you. Guys, please do not be afraid to applaud our poets. If you like what you hear, you can snap, you can scream, you can clap really loud, you can just don't boo, you know? You can, <laughs> you can throw me money, and I'll give them some of it. No. <laughs> but we do have a donation bucket if you would like to donate to the Festival of Words to contribute to our, our annual festival. We, we often we host workshops throughout St. Landry Parish and in, in the school systems to, to educate our, our youth and expose them to the literary arts. You know, these are rural areas, you know, often rural children of color. You know, we, we like to expose them to things they don't have access to because of where they are. Um, you guys ready for the next poet? Oh, yeah. It always like, it's like the room is disabled. The other side, scream. It, you should be louder, compensate. <laughs> so, the ne what is this? What's that? It was, it was like a bug leg or something, I don't know. Anyway, so the next, 
wordsmith to the mic is actually one of my favorite, favorite poets. You ever, you know when you hear a person's voice and it's just so smooth and addicting, you know, you want them to be on the night radio show, you know, <laughs> the love boom. <laughs> so um, our, next, our next wordsmith is a longtime word, word crawler. JK is an artist, poet, and mystic, and the author of one of my favorite books, Night, Mystery, and Light. Please give it up, JK, for JK McDowell. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, say ooh, smooth groove, cool, thanks. <laughs> I'm going to read from uh, my book, Night, Mystery, and Light, tonight, but I also have brought some new poems. Um, some of which have never been read, and some of which have never been seen. But I'm going to start off with one from this year uh, for fans of uh, True Detective Season 1. So this is called Carcosa Returns. No clouds, the lidless eyes of twin suns scorch my soul. I turn from the dawn, the dark seas glimmer and beckon. The ancient longing for Carcosa returns. A poetry reading at the court of the Yellow King. Never say no to any lover of your work. My tear-filled grief for Carcosa returns. We want the unseen demons beneath the surface. The crushing depths felt in every cold embrace. Her desire for the ways of Carcosa returns. Black stars rise and strange moons cross. Sparkling kava pours and dark duels erupt. The vengeance of lost Carcosa returns. Silent ciphers screaming, the blood days are here. Tatters of freedom remain and still reign. James, do not pray that the strange Carcosa returns. Poisons are potent reminders of trespasses. Any and all antidotes simply delays your death. Now the ancient curse on Carcosa returns. This is called Forever Lost. A noisy bar, nowhere special, just Tangiers. In the far booth is Paul Bowles, the expat novelist. You've recently arrived from Paris, never lost. We really do not know how to count the days. Endless, forever, rise, set, none are for us. Eternity to cross infinity, I'm still lost. I trace the moonlight across the desires of touching your naked skin, I'm awake. But this is your dream. The moon erupts and asks, are you lost? Are you lost? An important and curious question. Is there poetry here? Another query. Please, can we go back to when the answers were lost? The pause is essential, then the venomous strike. Bowles sits in the corner, arabesque tiles suit the room. The hand near the mouth, the chance is not lost. The desert, a baptism of solitude, yet no sheltering sky, only the beloved's eyes, and in that vision, I am wholly forever lost. This is called Never Dance. I knew Garcia Lorca had my back in this knife fight. His loyalty without reproach would sustain me in tonight's dance of blades under the moonlight. 46 in the left and 54 in the right, my soft young hands trembling in the long silence, 100 splinters and a single pair of scissors. 
The grape arbor was broken down servant to the vines. Overgrown, they ignored the weak, rot-eaten boards and the fruit that now spoils on the ground. I used to be a ghost of my former self. So many lost promises scribbled in the moonlight. This is who you were. Can I remember? Do not lament this constant unraveling. See the work, the fine embroidery, golden threads where the stains of violence sought to ruin your shirt. James, they say in whispers you have the obedience of an Andalusian dog, and the scent of duende will lead you where muse and angel never dance. <clears throat> this is brand new. The calendar says today is the last of August. I've already moved into September. I'm trying to catch up, stealing from the past. Writing one poem a month, is that contagious? Perhaps, but my poetry is self-inflicted, and you know Miss Stein says to always tell the truth. Those gone and lost gods who have left their claw marks on the old parts of my soul, the wounds are healed, stronger in some places. The night guard patrols the darkness. Torture is incomplete murder, not unlicensed sport. Your rendition tapes destroyed, but everyone is surprised how long the truth can hold its breath. And crinkled marlar does not chill the terror. The chain link fences cannot contain freedom's cries. We are all layers upon layers of anguish. Somewhere is that poem you're searching for. Today is much more desperate than other days. James, I'll tell you right now, this is not that poem. <laughs> and I'll finish up with a favorite. This is called The Divine Dream. When I first met Randolph Carter, we were tourists, Americans who had lost their way in a strange land. The reveal, that soft moonlit terrain, was your dream. I've crossed swords with many poison tipped blades, not always victorious, but always making art with these words in mind, to sleep, perchance to dream. Are your lips true? So much in our world has become plastic, virtual, synthetic, simulated. I know just to be able to kiss you would make real this dream. Are you awake? The fatigue stretches the sinews, and so much is out of proportion. One drop too many of this antidote, and I will never dream. James, your moonlight scribbling must cease for now. The healing need is for the imagination to bleed into reality. Close your eyes, just dream. These words are a failure. I can only ask your patience and blessing that these poems might someday make clear some gesture, some dance in the divine dream. Thank you very much. Thank you, J.K. McDowell. Y'all give him another round of applause, please. Raise your hand if you're tired. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're tired, but you'd rather lie than let people know you're tired. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm funny, guys. I'm fun. Well, I try to be. I'm not always funny. I'm trying to make sure I covered everything on the list because of my eyes are tired. Oh, volunteers. If you vol the volunteers this year, thank you guys so much for, for offering your support. Thank you to the word crawl uh, organizers, all of us, all of us. Thank us. 
for what us did. Us is tied, Misha. Um, if you would like to volunteer with Festival Awards for our event coming up November 2nd and 3rd, the wonderful Marie has it there at the door. You can sign up. Also, we do have merch on the table. We have wonderful Festival Awards shirts. We got new colors this year. Um, some of our authors, and we have our hats too. I forgot about the hats because I don't wear hats. My head is too big. Anyway, um, we have some of our authors uh, have product on the table, and they're donating a percentage of their um, their product to Festival Awards. I am one of the people. <laughs> this is my album, Scattered Thoughts. It's ten dollars, and I'll be donating fifty percent to Festival Awards. So, thank you guys for your support again. And I do take credit cards, and I also take social security numbers, and no. Is it, is it reading, or is it words? My, my album? Yeah. Spoken word poetry. Oh, yeah, music. performance poetry. Um, there's some music in there, a little singing, but eh, it's more about the poetry. I'm, I'm lyrically inclined, not musically inclined. I try, though. <laughs> People say, well, it's lyrics. Yeah, I get it, but give me the instruments, and I don't got it, so. Um, Y'all ready for the next wordsmith? C. Ray Bras Brasseur, did I say that right? Brasseur, teaches anthropology at UL. He is a bilingual Cajun. For this event, he is offering as a, sto he is offering as a storyteller a short nar narrative entitled The Origin of Cajun Names. Please give it up. Okay. So, I am astonished by the uh, creativity and the be beauty of the words that I've heard, you know, in this thing. And I just want to say, you know, that uh, we need to dial back for my presentation. <laughs> Quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, this is about creative expression. It's not necessarily my creative expression, but it's those that I've collected. So uh, let's see how it works out. The topic <clears throat> is anthropomonastics. Okay. <laughs> so yes, I am a college professor, but <laughs> I don't want to make this sound... It won't sound like a lecture, I don't think. At any rate, uh, that topic is associated with onomastics. Onomastics. Onomastics is an interesting subject that tries to research and search into and study names. Names of all kinds of things. So it could be names. Onomastics is about could be names of landscape, land features, it could be rivers, bayous, coulees, it could be any kind of thing. Uh, the, you know, if it's a name of a mountain, that doesn't help us very much, you know, in Louisiana. <clears throat> so uh, we'd have to figure out another kind of uh, topic, you know, like uh, perhaps a, a landfill. Now, landfills have a certain height, you know, it's almost like a mountain. They're not named quite as much, but anyway, I just noticed there is one I just found out near Mo. You all know where Mo is? Yeah. Well, Mo is a very interesting place because it is the heart of what the subject matter that I want to talk about, which is the origin of Cajun names. You know, and there's a lot of names that came out. I don't know if you all know that. You know, it came right out of Mo. I want to. So I want to get to that after a while. We won't talk so much about landfills, you know, uh, that kind of thing <laughs> at this moment. But uh, the topic of uh, surnames is really where I'm at right now, you know. So I want, there's a lot of, a lot of things about Cajun names that we could look at. Nicknames, uh, we have such a thing called D names, you know, Gino. 
and the Tino, you know, and all the nicknames and all that kind of stuff. But what I'm looking at is family names. And actually the topic I'm approaching here is a really a folkloric topic. So it's, it's an element of folklore. So what it is, is it's, a, it's a series of uh, comments or stories about the origin of Cajun names. And in that sense, it's kind of like mythology. So when we talk, when we think about, you know, it's mythological in the sense that that's how that name started. And then other people who have heard these stories say, no, it's more like a genre of BS. It's <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so solid in that range, you know, that we're talking about. Okay. So you can judge on yourself. And some of these uh, narratives, I just want to say, can be touchy because family names are sensitive. They're important to us. Our family names tell us who we are, you know, and they have a lot to do with our identity. So when you start talking about somebody's name, it, so at any rate, I just want to say, you know, t t uh, don't take it too seriously. You know, depending on what your name is uh, and whatever I might say, uh, I did not invent this or create it. I'm sharing it with you, okay? And in fact, some of the stories you might, I, I would say, and I've been told, you know, that the stories themselves are not worth repeating. You know, <laughs> you should not repeat those kinds of stories. And I, I've been told that it, it's true, you know. For example, you know there's a farmer who lived in the prairie there between Lafayette and Scott. Of course, there was no Scott at that time and there was no Lafayette either. You know, they were talking about the old days, you know. Farmer was living out there. You all may have heard this one, probably already heard that. At any rate, he was a pretty good farmer, hard worker, and as all of Cajun stories are, you know, to begin with, are the, the story of how it was when it was poor, you know, very poor. They didn't have anything. His family and he himself, he ate what he grew, of course, you know. Luckily, he could grow beans and he loved them. And it wasn't a bad uh, hardship on him to have to eat beans twice or maybe three times a day. But one thing about this fellow, is that he was what we call clean. He was a clean fellow, you know, and meaning that he would take a bath every Saturday, whether he needed it or not. <laughs> and in those days, the bath was, was a tub on the porch, you know. He had a tub on the porch, and we'd get out there, and he would, so he would sit down uh, to take his bath, and, and, and then, it was a, some kind of a mysterious sound that everybody could hear who was in the neighborhood there. And it went, bork, bork, bork. <laughs> the descendants of this fella were all named Bork. And, that, and that's how the name of that, how that name came to be, you know. And so now you can see what this kind of story is like. Now, there was another uh, uh, moment, you know, where people gathered and there were some people talking and trying to understand themselves and their names and how they came about. A question was asked about the Bro. Because the Bro family are spread out all over Louisiana. I mean, you can't go to a town where there's not a Bro, and usually a lot of families, sometimes they're dominated by Bros. And they're all over Louisiana. And the question was, why is that? How could that have possibly been? Well, there was an old man there. He knew why that was. So why it was, was there was a, a three bro brothers that came to Louisiana. And they arrived at the port in New Orleans with a bunch of Acadians on a ship. You know, they had been they, uh, deported from their home. And they arrived in New Orleans. And Span, Spain owned Louisiana at that time, and Spain decided they were going to welcome the Acadians, and they were going to give them whatever they could 
to make sure that they were successful in their calling here. So a Spanish officer greeted these Acadians. They said, look, form a line, come up to the table. When you come up to the table, we're going to ask you what you need, and we're going to provide what you need. So the Bro brothers got in line. Oh, Lord, I don't have time for this story. <laughs> they got in line, and they, uh, when they got at the, at the head of the line, he asked what they wanted. He said, well, what we need, we need a shot at and a horse. And a shot at, you all know, is a wooden a cart with two wheels, and that's what they need. The Spaniard asked him, well, what do you want us to put in the shot at? He said, what we need is a barrel of whiskey. <laughs> the biggest you can afford, you know. That's what we need. Okay. So he said, they put the barrel of whiskey in there, and the Bro brothers took off. Now, one thing about the Bros is that when they start something, they go after it. And it's hard for them to stop. It's part of their characteristic, apparently, you know, that, that bros go ahead and they do it, you know. So here they did. They took off. Oh, no. They had one, <laughs> they had one uh, older brother driving the shot at and the other two in the back with the whiskey barrel. And the driver drove the horse fast as he could, you know, on his way. See where he would go. The two in the back also opened up the whiskey and they went after the whiskey just like bros would do it. Well, by the time they got to a place that in nowadays they call it bouté. Well, in French, you know, bouté. But what happened was, you know, bouté sur un chicot with that charrette that he ran into a stump. One of the brothers fell off. As it turned out, that brother was left there raised a big family, and there's a lot of bros all in that area. You know? <laughs> but the older brother who was driving didn't even notice. He just kept going, you know. So when they, it's, all, it's all over with. The point is, the point of the story is, when they arrived on the Bayou Tech, and the oldest brother was driving the Chardet, he got tired, but he saw a big grove of trees. He went underneath the rest. When he got underneath those trees, he said, well, now I need to get my drink of whiskey. He got out. Both of his brothers had fallen off of the wagon. <laughs> he lost them. And when he hit that barrel there, it was completely gone. And so uh, he said, well, now listen. He said, I don't know what to do but I'm not going nowhere without any whiskey. That place is now called Pombro. <laughs> and all along the way, there's bros from, from New Orleans to Pombro. That's what they are. The point, of, the point of the story is, is that seemed to be why the bros were distributed all over the, the countryside, <laughs> is because that when they start something, they don't stop. And they won't do a damn thing without whiskey. <laughs> so I have some more stories, but I don't have time for them. Thank you very much. Please give it up for Mrs. C. C. Ray Brasser. Before we move on to the next wordsmith, I, I have two things. So, Mr. Brasur, uh, is it Dr. Brasur? Yeah, doctor, doctor, doc. Yes, I just graduated May 2017, so this is still good, right? Okay. You said, <laughs> you said I won't make this sound like a, a lecture. You were very funny. It was amazing. I loved it. It was great. Right. My first thought when you said that was, that's what they all say. <laughs> I graduated. But I want to work on my master's and PhD, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other thing you made me think of, Cajuns. 
I was, I was, I'm, I'm Creole. Creole Cajun people, we some strong pe people. So I'm driving down, um, I'm by Evangeline Elementary. I can't remember, it's Rue de Bellier, something that road. I'm driving down the road and I see a car riding real slow and then there's a horse next to the car. A horse, not a horse, I'm from the country. Anyway, the horse is next to the car and the person is like, like helping the horse stand up and the horse is leaning against the car and they're going down the street trying to get the horse to where it's going, I guess. But the fact that the, they're driving down the street using the car to hold up the horse and like Cajun people can make it happen. I have a picture of it somewhere, but it's like, damn, okay, I get it, all right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the things Creole people do, we won't even go that far. <laughs> um, so our next wordsmith, uh, one of my very good friends, Toby Daspit, the self-proclaimed bard of the Blue Dog Cafe, is a so <laughs> is associate professor of education and co-director of the National Writing Project of Acadiana at UL. Toby is a frequent reader in the Acadiana and New Orleans poetry scenes and conducts poetry workshops often in area schools. His poems have been published in many journals and anthologies. He was also featured, a featured author for the 2010 Festival of Words. His most recent chapbook, Bar Posters, was published in 2013 by Yellow Flag Press. Please give it up for Toby Daspit. <laughs> Dinner for three. It always starts with the eyes, you say, asking why mine spin away every time we speak. People will never believe you, your law school training assures me, if you can't look them in the eyes. Or at least the eyebrows, you say, slipping off your wedding band. They'll never know the difference. <laughs> Porto, and this is after a Georgia O'Keeffe uh, painting my last door opens with a Suzanne Beer quote from the movie After the Wedding. I don't know what to say. It's new for me. Zero. I knew you before I met you. One, the shadow is the first thing you notice, wondering where the door is, wondering where your voice is, until you notice that it's not a shadow, but rather some forbidden portal, some passageway to that place where fear surrenders, becomes real, becomes you. Two, you asked me in a voice I didn't recognize. You never explained why you took. You admitted you couldn't. Three, you fold the smudged newspaper over, ask me to list words that begin and end with the letter H, another one of your endless games. Hash, hutch, hearth, hitch, hush, you fill in the middle when the puzzle allows, knowing all the time that shadows rest somewhere in between. Four, this place we refuse to name has its own rules, of course, its own mechanisms of injury. Past failures multiply in a puzzling algorithm of desire, fear, hesitation, balance. Five, the bottle of what I don't recall, sat between us on your tiny kitchen table, each of our glasses empty. You tipped the bottle, seemingly parceling an equal amount in each of our glasses. But a life of searching forbidden eyes and shared silences leads me to conclude that you made sure your glass contained just a little more. Mm -hmm. Six, blood bruises, spine soaks, Eyes dissect, surrender, those things we know but cannot name. This one's called Lot's Wife at Carthage, and it's after a Linda Frege collage painting. Bob Dylan says, the world has gone black before my eyes. 
Why not recall that purple August night when over dinner your chocolate eyes dripped the world no longer in ruins? Why not tell how you arched your hungry tongue under every word dissolving desire like salt? Why not speak about how your promises crumbled universes in our open palms, lifelines etched in chalky futures? Why not remember when later that night we stumbled from opposite sides into your bed, our shadows never touching? Why not ask what it means to dream three times in one night about someone sleeping next to you? Why not say what happened when you lumbered out of bed early the next morning and I managed to unstaple my eyes for a monosyllabic moment? I caught you tossing a fossilized glance over your right shoulder like some shop-worn muse fumbling for loose change. Anatomy of a ghost. Ghost of you walks. It's a Richard Thompson quote. One, it doesn't walk, it tiptoes, cat-like, finding new hiding places every day. Two, a chilled wind clouds from your mouth, staccato silences. Three, nothing withstands the brittle architecture of your absence. Four, the words only sputter now, rarely stain the page, but tonight I feel something rattling, coursing down my spine. Oh, wait, it's not a poem. It's only your memory haunting my last refuge. Five, Pittsburgh, November. I sit sipping iced tea at a Pepto-Bismol baby powder blue diner that smells like our last breakfast together. After a dizzy Sunday morning of lazy, famished lovemaking, we swell our bloodstreams with spiky, spicy, Bloody Mary's and undercooked bacon. I keep the receipt from that morning with many others, but I think I'll throw this one away. Six, from the edge of your bed, still rumpled, from your fetal curl, I hear you whisper as you did only once, I love you, I love you, I love you. Then evaporate from this house of cards you never called home. Seven, you used to help me prop up the corner of this bar, dripping over every drink, peeling beer bottle labels, smiling when I caught a glimpse of you glimpsing me. Eight, she has your hair, and when she walked in, my heart did a thing, but not the thing. Her eyes tell a different story. Yours spoke centuries. Hers haven't even soaked up today. Nine, the bartender has the same slow swerve in her hips you did. I can watch her every Monday, Friday, and Saturday. I don't know where or when you'll appear. Ten, you're there in the crescent moon in every bruised sigh. Eleven, the first time you fucked me, you brought over a bottle of Jim Beam Black. We drained it. I nestled it on a shelf I doubt you ever noticed. Twelve, you swivel unexpectedly around the corner, flesh this time, but less real than your ghost's shadow. And I'm going to finish up with Anatomy of a Corpse. Opens with the Raymond Carver line. Would I live my life over again, make the same unforgivable mistakes? Yes, given half a chance. Yeah. Yes. This love is being dismantled. Bar by bar, kiss by kiss, argument by argument, movie by movie, souvenir by souvenir, toothbrush by toothbrush, promise by promise. This love echoes carrying songs from, I can't take my eyes off of you. I can't take my eyes off of you. I can't take my mind off of you to kiss me, kiss me, kiss me. Get it out, get it out, get it out. Get your fucking voice out of my head. This love wobbles under the nauseous inertia of words unspoken. This love traces its tongue against dragonfly skulls. This love's spine is brittle. This love is haunted sleep. This love is vampire breath on a mirror. This love was never photographed. This love screams that you are supposed to be gone. This love couldn't withstand your 80 proof eyes. This love couldn't solve the mathematics of accidental collision. This love is not dead. This love never lived. <laughs> Toby Daskert. Y'all give it up for Toby again.
Raise your hand if you're still awake. <laughs> we are down to our last performer, our last wordsmith. Um, wait, y'all, wait, hold on. Where y'all going? Mr. Miller, y'all leaving? Huh? <laughs> I was gonna do I was gonna do a, a few stanzas or something real fast, but we're just gonna move on to the next wordsmith. So the next wordsmith coming to the mic is my brother from another mother. I I love this man with my 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 heart my soul. I don't know. It's just we need to work on writing a team piece together. Um, it'll happen when when God says it should. When the universe wants us to do it, it'll happen because our energies just match so well. Um, and he also has a, an event running, the Magnolia Shed series, and I think they're working to be uh, nonprofit as well. He has a lot of uh, stuff going on, and I'd, I'd rather him come and tell you more about his heavy lifting and, and working and his writing and, and flailing his pen around and just, uh, I love him, I love him. Um, so please, without further ado, please give it up for James Blanchard. Thank you, Alex. That's my sister right there. And we will do that team piece for sure. Um, and it'll be fire. Um, I haven't been to Word Call in a couple years and throughout the day I've been seeing how much it's grown. I'll, everybody a big round of applause for um, everybody that's been involved in it, for Patrice. Um, I'm gonna get right into it. Uh, this is a poem. These a couple of these poems. I do this thing where I ask people or friends for ten words. I ask them for them for a subject. I like to write poems for people, so I'll have them give me something they want me to write about, and they'll give me ten words, and I'll use those words in a poem. This one's a short one. It's for I, I read a lot about uh, a friend of mine, Eric. I mention him a lot of my poetry. He's a friend of mine that drowned. And this is his for his sister, um, which she's trading a painting of a dog that passed away that she painted for it. But um, rain on tin roof. Every drop, the sound of something simple. We grew up bare feet in the garden, between good and evil. Sunlight shows what the shadow hides. Us, bare knuckle, punching our way out of a dragon's mouth. True tranquility, your children's happiness now. Paint-covered fingers find a place to call home on every blank canvas. We call it growing old or up, but it's a better way to appreciate soft grass and a world made of gravel. <clears throat> this is another one in the same style. Uh, this one's called self-actualization. Identity is a slippery thing to weigh, the way it weaves in and out of focus. In order to receive growth, one must be willing to be broken open first. What thirst is this supplying pressure to parched lips? Reliance a hard thing to acquire when we've fallen for the wrong truth a time or two. How does one hold on to hope when we've seen both heaven and hell in the same face? Lust. A good way to get closer to God, another form of communion. Lively, we smile darkness into sunlight to make this day longer. Am I disappearing into myself again? I never know for sure. Lost, we roam this night like wild dogs in search of wisdom. We keep our spirit clenched in our teeth for the fear of it flying away. Home is not the only place one one's heart can rest. <clears throat> uh, this is a poem that I'm working on that's going into a, a live set that I'm working on. I'm gonna be doing poetry and lyric for 30 minutes straight in Galveston, uh, coming up in October. It's called How to Shout from, uh, the name of the set's gonna be Good Grief. How to Shout from the, and some of these other ones are gonna be in it too. How to Shout from the Edge of Nowhere. We grew up in Ambridge, Pennsylvania, a steel mill town that lacked original thought so much that the elders named it after the American Steel Company and the bridge that connected it to civilization on the other side of the Ohio River. We grew up after the days of steel, though. 
We grew up after Reagan sold our fathers and grandfathers' souls to China, leaving only oxies and morons and old timers always bitching about the golden days while sitting at the same bar on the same stool, salting their brew. We didn't see those golden days, though, only the way that their memories could sew our mouths shut. It's hard to keep quiet and be grateful for what you have when you ain't got nothing. We found another place to scream at the dark. Next to Ambridge was the largest train docking station on the eastern seaboard, just boxcar after boxcar after boxcar, as far as your eyes could see. All a kid needed was a pair of brass balls and a can of Krylon, and he or she could hoot and holler and yell as loud and as long as they wanted. Shout. There we were, night after night, drunk on malt liquor and teen angst sending smoke signals to places we would likely never see, just bright colors and big words coming from the darkness. How else does one get their voice from the void's rusted edge? You shout until your voice is lost, which is an entirely different thing than having it taken from you. So I write a lot of dark stuff and uh, also um, teeny angst stuff. Uh, this is brought to you by Metal Mosh Pits, Teen Angst, and all that good stuff. When someone leaves us, a pit opens up. Grief, a hole that can't be filled, though we try with all the wrong things. A bottomless well of wishes, I wish you were here, I wish I would have said goodbye, or I love you, or I'm sorry. When Eric and Brandy died, I became a whole, forming the void, black as night, nothing, filled with one repetitive wish that I was dead. Tried to fill myself with all those wrong things, my room, an imploding star, myself, a candle slowly burning at both ends, insufferably, I swallowed all the light around and pushed away. Too chicken shit to swallow the bullet, so I swallowed whiskey, pills, and other people. Whatever was in reach, developed a savage hunger for my suffering, figured I would die slow and enjoy the ride. A slow endeavor as you dig and dig and dig and bury yourself under the rearranging. A reverse Sisyphus feeling no one could ever understand what this feels like. Then I discovered you can fill a hole with a hole, a pit with a pit, this place where other people come with their own holes to fill. Shotgun chic, Swiss cheese saint swaying to a wall of sound, filling the void with songs of rage, drums kick with warrior heart, bass slaps the shit from your senses, guitar riffs ripping the wrong from your guts the right way, and then the lead screams at God like you wish you could. I am alive! Then the hollowed bodies of other broken brazenly crash against you all, lost cause, recluse reject, self-harm, hopeless romantic redux, just arms, elbows, assholes, and the blood that you wanted to let go. And you do just that. You let this senseless sea take you, and you fall, and bone meets pavement, but this time it doesn't break you. Instead, you bounce back up with the help of unknown comrades within this crucible. Smile. Here, you are not alone in your sadness, and when you fall, someone will help you back up. Um, how am I on time? Two minutes and 20 seconds? Okay. Um, I'm gonna do some lyrics now. I'm in a band called Orange Lazarus, and usually there's a lot of people and a backup singer and all that other stuff. None of that shit's here. I can't really sing. I call it throwing gravel at people, so here we go. <clears throat> all my friends are broken. All my friends are coping. All my friends are hoping. Been that them night sweats don't soak them. I had a dream in which I slipped my wrist. See a kiss had missed these lips of bliss. Life isn't just a box of chocolates, y'all. It's these leaky faucets and broken watches. It's never knowing what the cost is for a flower to blossom. 
It isn't often the world spinning nauseous. Those like us proceed with caution. So you either live in dead or you play in possum. Now I found the door, but where's the key? See, I braved the sea, but I can't bear to see these tears that flee, this face that bleeds, these fears we feed into the space we need. Now these are just some observations that I have made from late nights pacing, my brain on fire, y'all, my heartbeat racing, trapped inside amphetamine mazes. Next day, I mirror facing mistakes I made when in search of a place of stasis. Now grave digging's hard work and the Lord knows I've dug a couple, but now this mic is a muzzle, this life is a puzzle. Who got the lie? Cause I got the shovel. Heart full of hope, but a brain full of trouble. See, I no longer think about leaving, but there's something deceiving about the sound of my demons. They screaming at nothing, but they screaming with meaning through the cracks they keep seeping. Now the relapsing I'm sinking, even with this light that I'm keeping, still got me believing this life has no reason. Not a reaper is creeping. A grave is just another way to say you shouldn't have strayed from the path that you paved. Now, lie in that bed that you made for the God that you prayed and the devil you slayed are both one and the same. If you're going through hell, well, I know the route. See, I got one foot in, I got one foot out, and I'm going in till there's no way out, spitting hellfire brimstone till my mouth is a drought. James Blanchard. And that concludes our 12 hour word crawl event. Raise your hand if you're still alive. Today was a, a, a beautiful, beautiful day. Guys, before you leave, please stop by our merch table. Um, we do have some products. I have my album, Scattered Thoughts. It's damn near free. And 50% <laughs> will go to Festival Awards. And we do have some other artist products up there. Um, what am I missing, Marie? Donations. Donations, please donate, donate. Also, if you'd like to volunteer, the list is there. Festival of Words this year is the 2nd and 3rd of November in Grand Coteau. Follow us, um, Festival Words, on Facebook, festivalwords.org. We love you. You don't have to go home, but you have to, you know, I'm going to have to say that. I love you guys. Let's go to bed. Yeah. <laughs>